Hey guys, it's Mark Holtley here, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher. Uh, today is a pretty good day, I must say. Um, I was uh, slaving away trying to get my um, my paper completed for uh, our immigration online conference that we have tomorrow. So I thought I would just jump on really, really quick here and, and do one. I'm sorry that I'm a little bit late. People are probably wondering, hey, Mark, are you even going to do this? And uh, yeah, so I've got, uh, it's a little bit rough and tumble, a little bit more um, scrambling ag around, I guess, if you will, as we're trying to get everything uh, set up here for this live Q&A today. But today it's all about you guys. So what I'm going to be doing is making sure that um, uh, as, we, as we move forward with this, that the, the questions that I answer are gonna come right at the front. Last Tuesday, it was an actually, it was an awesome, awesome presentation. Any questions people have about entering Canada, about the travel restrictions, Kyle Heineman and myself, we really, really spent a lot of time trying to dive right in deep into what those border officers are looking at when they're determining whether or not to let you into Canada. So, um, so we covered that. Um, I'm gonna do a couple things as I'm going through here. We're gonna give some shout outs to the people that are tuning in. Um, so welcome uh, everybody here as I'm just, uh, <laughs> as we, as we're going through this, let's see, we've got Ozawara uh, from Nigeria, but currently in the Congo. Great to have you with us. Darshan is Mississauga. Uh, let's see who else we have here. We've got Cynthia from Jakarta. Welcome, Cynthia. And uh, Manu is Belarus. Very cool. We've got Ambu down in Miami. All right, now we're starting to heat things up. Okay, good. This is great. No. So this is one of the things that I'm always dealing with is audio. So I'm gonna crank this up a little bit so that you guys can hear me. And it's interesting, I recorded a podcast episode last time. So we'll get the mic up here a little bit closer and make sure that it's a little bit better. So uh, let me know, Anbar says, hey, you need to increase the volume. So let me know, Anbar, how's that, how's that volume? That should be fairly good now. I think it's kind of peaking now in the yellow here on my on my sound level screen. So let me know if that sounds okay. Give me a thumbs up so I can see. Um, and then my Tommy says, can you stream an hour earlier? The reason that I switched from from 1 to 12, uh, from 12 to 1, was because I had conflicting meetings with the government. So every couple days we had our um, live, um, well, our, our, our conference calls with them regarding processing the issues that COVID-19 is having uh, with the government processing. And so those were falling right at noon. So because of that, I had to change the time. But I will take this under advisement. <laughs> okay. Uh, Clara says, hi. Hi, Clara. Great to have you with us here. Um, we're seeing a lot of, you know, I'm seeing a lot of YouTube here, Igor, and I am not seeing Facebook at all. So I can tell you, I, Facebook has not been my friend. So hopefully, um, and maybe Igor, you can check this out and let me know, but I'm not seeing a lot of Facebook on here, which is really, um, really frustrating because I know for a fact that uh, that is where a lot of the people are tuning in from. So we've got all YouTube so far. So we've got um, uh, Sri Lanka representation here. We've got Edmonton. Um, we've got India. And Cynthia says, what's my email? Cynthia, just go to... Let me just see if I can flip this over here to the website view. We'll switch it over here. Do, 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 do. Okay. And all right, so we'll flip this over. So right here, if you're looking for a consult, just go right here to our website, click on the start here button, and that will let you connect. And that's the best way to connect with us, all right? Okay, so flip back here. Let's see who else we've got. Um, oh, Karen says he's locked down in Delhi. We've got uh, Petersburg in Dubai. Um, a big shout out to uh, Josh and Deep. Uh, Priya is with us. We've got uh, Elibs. <laughs> uh, we're going to go Eli, maybe San Francisco on that one. Welcome. Okay, uh, Maz says the sounds good and we're getting lots of good thumbs up. That is what I like to see. Yes, absolutely. Um, oh, Darshan says he just missed by one point. Oh, we got notified that one of our clients, another one of our clients just got drawn. And so um, some of you, you may or may not know, and probably a lot of you have when it comes to express entry, that today we just had another draw. 
And um, it looks like they're continuing down the path of Canadian experience class. So, um, and this is these totals, boy, I'll tell you guys, I'm going to shift back here again to the to the scene. You can see here these totals. It has been a long time since we've dropped down to 440. And um, and that is that is super, super low in terms of our historical numbers for Express Entry. So big shout out to the 3,515 people who received an invitation to apply in this draw with a score of at least 440. So big shout out to all of you out there who have um, yeah, who've actually uh, been fortunate enough to get that draw. So, so sorry, Darshan, that you just missed it. So close. Okay, let's see here. Um, uh, Rochelle says, can I ask questions? <clears throat> you can in just one second. Uh, okay, Amin says, uh, big thumbs up. You can see we've got Periscope and YouTube, but no Facebook representation today, which is really interesting. So we're going to have to look into that. Once again, I shouldn't probably just say Facebook sucks all the time. Maybe that's why, <laughs> but this is definitely, it looks like it's becoming um, a YouTube thing here. And, uh, but it's pretty amazing that we have, we've got just about a hundred people here watching on YouTube. So hang in there. We're going to jump right into questions here in a second. We'll wait for a few more people to connect. We've got Victor in Calgary. That's YYC. Awesome to have you, Victor. Fantastic there. Let's see who else we have here. Uh, oh, we got the big thumbs up for Petersburg. <laughs> there we go. And I think he's confirming the sound is good. Um, okay, so side, hold off on your question here. We'll get to you in a second. Bella, hello. Sager, hi to you, my friend. Crudy's tuning in from India. Excellent. And I know you guys in India that it's after one o'clock in the morning. So I am so grateful for your dedication and for being here. Crudy, uh, yes, thanks for coming. Karthik's over Niger uh, Niagara Falls. Very cool. We've got South African representation. We've got another Emeka, my good buddy. Welcome, welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, all right. Uh, and Ori, very cool. A big shout out. Congratulations to everybody else. Uh, Siva from Toronto. Welcome, Siva. And I'm just shouting out everybody who um, uh, who is indicating where they're tuning in from. We've got uh, Roxy from Toronto. A big hi to you. Mapala um, uh, says, "Hey, how are you doing, Mark? I'm doing awesome. This is great. We've got a really good uh, a really good group of people here. So what I want you to do is, um, and I can just go on forever and ever. So we've got Sandy, we've got uh, Phuket, we've got Litsa, Lebanon. Great to have you here. All right. So what we're going to do is um, now." Just because I want this to be, um, I want this to be all about you guys. So if you're tuning in for the first time, Canadian immigration lawyer Mark Holthy here, welcoming you, and I am going to take all questions. So you can fire anything you want at me today. This is all about you guys. Last week or the other couple days ago, it was as much an experiment to see in in the format that I created it if I could bring in other lawyers, other people who can help. And so um, uh, to, to just carry this message to all of you guys in a way that 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 you really need to receive it. So um, hello to you, Ken Wajit. And uh, all right. So now the questions are going to start to fly. OK, so now you can post your questions. So we'll start here with uh, with Cham here. And says, are there are there chances that PR applications will get processed in under six months? You know what? I'm going to say that that, that it's going to be. There might be some of you that do slip through and get through in under six months. That's possible. I think the long-term ramifications of this COVID-19 situation, the social distancing, all these things are going to result in, um, I really think that they're going to result in longer processing times. So don't be discouraged with that. Understand that, you know, it might take a little bit longer, but, you know, but the reality is when I compare it to what it was before Express Entry, and we're talking January the 1st, 2015, I remember it well. That's when Express Entry, you know, was was unveiled with this grand fanfare. And one of the reasons they did it is because in some countries, all that individuals needed to do were to qualify through the Federal Skilled Worker Program. So if we if I if I flip over here to my website here and we look at the rounds of invitations, you can see here who's in the pool. So every single one of these people that's in the pool somehow is qualified or have become um, eligible for applying through the Federal Skilled Worker Program, the Canadian Experience class, or the Federal Skilled Trades. Well, before Express Entry, well, even a little bit before that, Federal Skilled Worker Program used to be the only game in town. 
And so if you met the eligibility requirements, those 67 points out of 100, and you've got the one year continuous full-time work experience, skilled, paid, full-time work. Um, if you met the minimum eligibility, then it was just a matter of processing times. But in some countries, it was like seven years to get your application processed. It was crazy. The government just did not want that happen. So they actually adopted the Australian model um, for this express processing of permanent residence. And as a result of that, um, uh, Canada unveiled their express entry program in, um, in ge on January the 1st of 2015. It's hard to believe it's been over five years ago, but that's the reality. And so that kick-started my practice in terms of all of this express entry that I've been doing. But that is one of the um, one of the realities. If you look at this, then every single one of these people, now some will be federal skilled trade, some will be CEC, but we know the vast majority of people that are in this pool, even these 50,000 that are at 351, you can see a large portion of this 144,000 um, would have to be processed. And if it just kept building and building and building, and the government only had so much room to process applicants each year, there's only so many they let in every year, then the processing times just skyrocketed. You know, two years was a minimum. So a little bit over six months, I know for a fact that's not, um, you know, it's not something that people are super, super excited about, the prospect that maybe it's going to take a little bit longer, but that is a reality. Okay, I can hear your questions filing in here really fast. Um, okay, Cynthia says, do you have any representative office at Jakarta, Indonesia? Um, Cynthia, there is no need for that in person at all. Express entry is completely virtual. When I represent my clients all over the world, we do it just like this. In fact, you're on the other side of the screen. You see me exactly, well, maybe not with the same background that I have here, but you see me almost exactly as you see me here. And I flip my screen around just like I'm doing it here with you. I flip my screen around and um, and I, I we look at your documents together. Um, we review everything together. And it's almost, in my mind, I argue it's better than if I had some office there. Because if I had some office there, that means I'd have someone employed there to work with you. And I don't want that. What I want is to be able to work directly with all of you myself. And through this model that I've created, that's why it is so awesome. So, so Cynthia, that's why at this stage I haven't set up um, uh, an office in Indonesia or India or Nigeria or wherever. So, Shib, good to see you, my friend. Welcome, welcome. All right, let's see what we've got here from Gagandeep. Uh, I'm Gagan, sir. My wife has secondary school teacher experience of three years. Her brother is in Manitoba. Can you uh, please make video regarding <laughs> Manitoba PNP? You know, I think what I need to do is bring in one of my colleagues from Manitoba to actually talk about this. So maybe we'll have some PNP specific um, Q and A's just like this. And one of the cool things, if you go back and watch what I did on Tuesday with Kyle, is that's the model that I'm looking at. Bringing in other people as well to, to augment. I don't file a lot of Manitoba PNP um, applications, but my friends in Manitoba do. Um, that are just awesome. And so by bringing them in, highlighting them, you're getting the very, very best. And I do not pretend to be um, the, the master of everything. Can I file and submit and help you with every single application? Yes, I can. Absolutely. Um, but I like to really focus and make sure that, um, that I am, well, as a lawyer, I can't say I'm an expert, but just really, really practicing at a very high level. So in that regard, when you have a Manitoba issue, I'll send you over to my good friend Sophia Mirza or Alistair or um, one of my other immigration lawyers that practices in Manitoba. Okay, uh, Zore is waiting for a letter of interest from Nova Scotia. Good luck. Good luck. Okay, Crudy, let's see what you got here. You have, Crudy. Uh, let's see. I guess has given me a master's degree. Um, uh, I sent three degrees in total for post-grad diploma. They've just said as completion of certificate from university. So should I mention the approval or is it okay not to? Um, ultimately, if you're claiming points, then you'll include it in your study history. Now, when you include it in your study history, you can indicate whether or not you have an ECA or not. And that will basically tell the government that you want to claim points or you don't. So that's how I deal with it. So ultimately, if you have, uh, in this case, Akis has given you a master's degree. That's awesome. Many of my clients will um, will just put masters in uh, their study history. But remember, in your personal history, if it falls within that 10 years, you're going to list everything. Everything's going in there. All right. Okay, let's see, Emeka, any update on the processing visa extensions? 
Hey, Mecca, oh my friend, couldn't make it to Canada before my visa expired. Quite heartbroken. Hey, Mecca, you better have notified them. Your visa is not done. Okay, my friend, you better have notified them. This is <clears throat> this is something that's really important, Mecca. You are not out of the you are not out of the game, my friend. You are still in it. Okay, I'm gonna pull this up here. Um, PDI PR uh, IRCC um, COVID. Okay, I gotta try to find this because I don't have this link for you. Let me just see program delivery. Uh, okay, I can find. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. This is for my friend Mecca. Okay. You are not out of the woods, my friend. You need to notify immediately. And if you maybe you've already done that, Emeka, but I don't want you to, to fall into this trap. So approved permanent resident applications, okay? Expired COPR. If the applicant informs via web form that they are unable or unwilling to travel after the expiration of their COPR, or if they're unable or unwilling to travel prior, officers are to reopen the application and it should be brought forward for review in 90 days. So the first thing you're gonna do, my friend, is you're gonna notify them via the web form, the IRCC web form. I think you guys know where that is. Let's just pull it up. Web form right here. You're gonna go in here. You're gonna to explain to them what's going on. You're gonna clearly, clearly articulate that you wanna travel. You desperately want to be in Canada, but because of, and I'm just gonna close that off, but because of, uh, the travel restrictions you weren't able to board so you are not done emeka hang in there a little bit of a delay but you're on this man go follow those instructions uh, get her done and preserve your right okay all right zare says 4212 fantastic my friend <laughs> fantastic okay all right let's go back here we'll drop emeka off and we will uh, okay, let's see who's next. Okay, Rochelle says, um, I applied for my spousal sponsorship. And you can see here, guys, that this is, for some reason, we have no Facebook going on here. So this is a huge, massive shout out to all you YouTubers because we got over 100, just about 140 people watching live. Post your questions. I'm going to get to them. I'm going to give you guys the time. If you're patient, you stick around. I will reward you. Okay, this is all about you awesome people. Okay, Rochelle says, applied for spousal in February, studied here in Toronto. How long is the processing for an open work permit? Okay, Rochelle's talking about this open work permit that you include with your in Canada spousal application. Four months was the standard. Right now, we have not been receiving a lot back. So we're not certain at this stage where they're at. Understand they're, they're having to deal with all of this processing for not just in Canada, but all of the overseas missions with their skeleton crews that have been decimated, that have not yet been um, returned back to full, you know, full order, full processing. A lot of those, at least the urgent ones, are being pushed back to Canada here. And people are working remotely. They're working from their homes. Immigration is doing all that they can. But people like you, Rochelle, that are stuck with these types of applications, they are still moving forward. But at this stage, we have not received any back yet. Um, I have to assume that it's going to be longer than four months. So your February, March, April, May, June, June in a in a in a perfect storm. In, well, in a perfect world, June would have been probably when you would have looked at receiving it. I'm suspecting you're probably going to be the end of the summer. That's my guess. Okay, Gag insists my Sears is going to be 4:42 on June the first under CEC. What are the chances, dude? What do you mean going to be 4:42 on June the first? So are you assuming? Am I assuming that you're not there yet? So what's the significance of June 1st? Usually when people tell me a date, it means they're having a birth date and it's going to drop. So Gagan, if you are CEC, um, is that when you accumulate your one year? Maybe that's when you hit your one year. Hey, they've already hit 440. So if they're going to do another round of CECs, understand it's entirely possible, Gagan, that you could get drawn. But I don't know the full facts there. Okay. All right. Let's see what Said says here. May I ask, what's the difference between a background verification and a security? Okay. So basically... Background is when they take a look at your police certificate. Is it complete? Is it valid? Does it show anything? No? Okay, great. Background? Great. Security. Are you an Al-Qaeda warrior? Are you, you have, you know, uh, when they do their own background checks, are there any, any indications when they do their own search that you're somehow a security threat to Canada? That's the difference. So background focuses on the documents you provide them, the, the police certificates to make sure that they're valid, that they've complied with the requirements, that they're within the right time zone, all you know, within the time frame that that um, that allows them to be valid. And then security is all about doing background checks their own through their own mechanisms to make sure you're not some uh, 
some crazy terrorist or something like that. And I know that's kind of harsh, but that's basically what it is. If there's, you know, that you're not somehow otherwise inadmissible, that you haven't been uh, removed before and you're not eligible to come in, that's what it is. Okay, all right, Eli, let's see what we got here. Generally speaking, which class of applicants in the express entry pool should tend to have a higher CRS score? FSW or CEC, trying to judge how the CRS score cutoff will change post-COVID. Understand, CEC is being completely scooped out. Anyone with a CEC, anyone right now that's over 440 points is going to be a federal skilled worker. So you guys can do the math. Let's flip this back and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So if we go back here to the rounds of invitations and we look at this. Now remember, this is as of May 25th. So even some of these other CEC candidates that were down here in this in this 440 range right here, these guys, um, all of them are all of these ones have been scooped out that are CECs. So I don't know how many would have been at the 441. We knew we just had a, a recent we just had a draw recently that I was think was at 447. And so understand that everyone up above this 450 cutoff. So if we look at this. There's 8,000 here. If we look at 451 to 500, there are 19,864 at least federal skilled worker candidates in the pool, okay, that are above 451 to 500. So we know by and large that the vast majority, almost 20,000 are federal skilled worker. What does that tell me when the draws start to happen? My belief right now is that these are like, they're going to be up, up, up above 471 for sure. And the reason that these numbers are not higher here with all these draws going on is because um, people just couldn't get their language tests to get back into the pool. So now that the language tests are starting to get open, people are writing them, they're getting their results. This number is going to probably going to be in that range where the draws are going to happen. Okay, we've got 7,000 that are underneath here. And understand the vast majority of these are all federal skilled worker. All right. Hopefully that helps. Um, uh, with kind of that explanation a little bit. Okay, let's see. We'll flip back here to the main view. Okay, moving on. Next is, okay, Zori says, I made an express entry profile on the 19th of February with interest shown in Nova Scotia. Good luck, my friend. Good luck. Okay, um, Varen says, I applied for my PR card on March the 8th, but I have not received it yet. Any idea by when it would I would get it? Dude, you are not getting it for quite some time. <laughs> you are not. Okay, so if we flip back to, to the screen here again, uh, let's go here. Actually, I'm going to open up a new window here, and we're going to go IRCC processing, uh, processing times. Okay, so we pull this up. I want to show you this. You guys can look this up yourself. You don't need me to pull it up on my computer. Look at this. Due to impacts, processing applications normally, uh, accurate, uh, these <laughs> these these processing times are not going to be accurate. These are who they're prioritizing. People returning to Canada, vulnerable people, people who perform or support essential services. What are they? They are the fight against COVID-19, um, health care, uh, maintaining our food supply, agriculture, these types of things. I We also, you know, I've got a corporate client who's who's building this um, this water treatment uh, and they're drilling the pipeline underneath this lake out in uh, out in British Columbia. And so those guys coming in from uh, from uh, from the US and from the UK, these techs that are super expert in, in working these um, these tunneling and boring machines. Yes, they're getting in. But the rest of you guys understand this is good impact processing. So let's go here. Let's open up and you can all this is where you go. Permanent resident cards. We're talking about, um, no, I'm waiting for my first card. Get processing times. Take a look, guys. 108 days. This is the new normal. Last updated May 26th, just a few days ago. All right? So understand, this is the world that we are living in. Whew. Okay, continuing on. Firing through here. Uh, okay, can my SO apply for visitor visa under review? If yes, what are chances and would that affect your residency application? Okay, if, it depends on what stage you're at. I understand you can always apply for a visitor visa. I always recommend if you're going to do that, that you do that before you even hint at an interest in immigrating to Canada. Why? Because they'll say, okay, do you really have temporary intent? if you intend to um, immigrate through express entry. And they'll use that as a reason to refuse Kishin. And so there's no stopping you, there's no harm in making the application. But to be successful, boy, you've got to really, really put in a ton of information to prove 
that they at this time will only abide by the visitor visa, the temporary conditions on the stay, and that they will go back because immigration will absolutely use the fact that there's a PR in, in the queue um, to, uh, to you know, w when they're deciding whether or not to accept or reject any temporary application. And let's face it right now, for visitor visas, no one's coming to Canada. Go back, watch the video I did with Kyle. You can check it out on YouTube um, just on Tuesday of last, just Tuesday of this week, just two days ago. And we went through all of this, but visitors are not coming anytime soon. Not until the travel restrictions are lifted. Okay, oh, Rami's sitting at 475. Oh, is there a possibility that the CRS cutoff exceeds this once FSW draws resume? We just talked about this a little bit. As I jump back here, Rami, I'm gonna take yours off of the screen. I'm going to flip back to here. As we look at these rounds of invitations, you guys can do the math, right? You can see if at, at, four, at 471 to 480, there's 3,311. At 481 to 490, we've got, and that's a really high score. We have over 1,000. So you guys can kind of do the math, right? 491 to 500, 329. So when you add up all of these, we're closing in on 5,000. So that means that it's definitely going to be somewhere in the middle here. And, um, you know, it could be that 475 is the cutoff. It'll be close. But once they resume those rounds, 475 is really in that sweet spot. It's really hard to get up to the 480s um, unless you have some connection with Canada already. And so um, it's, it's, it'll be interesting to see, you, you know, you, these people are master's degrees with, with um, not just CLB9, but in some instances 10 that are not much older than 29. They're not losing any age points. So all of those factors come, at, uh, come into play and it's probably going to rest. We're going to see the scores right somewhere in between 470 and 480. That's going to be kind of the sweet spot going forward. Okay. All right. We'll jump back here to the main view. Okay, Marcel says New Brunswick announced today that students can come to start classes in September. Hey, that's fantastic, Marcel. Make sure that you post the link if you can. I'm not sure if you can post a link or not. If you can, post that link. Um, that's that's great news. And also go into my study permit law website and post that as well. Okay, so I've got a Facebook group that's a, a study permit law, just like Express Entry Law, which Obviously, right now, we're all just YouTube today, but we've got a phenomenal group of people that are watching on YouTube. Freak, I'm wondering why I even need Facebook at this stage. We've got over 150 people watching live right now. Okay, and there's a lot of people with a lot of questions. Hang in there. I will be firing through this. I'm going to be spending a little bit more time to answer your questions because today is all about you guys. All right, while we're shifting here, we've got Gagan. Um, we've, ans we, we've answered those questions already. I want to just point something out to you guys. And um, Igor, uh, he he released this and I didn't realize that he had actually done it. I'm gonna go back to the main website. He just told me today, because I saw that there were people purchasing it. And I was like, oh, cool. We got some new people that are, that are coming in. This Express Entry DIY course, um, we are offering, uh, if you go here and you purchase the course, um, we're offering a special deal on this. And uh, regular, it's $497 US. There's two ways that you can access it. Uh, one of them is to type in EEDIY50. That'll do it. And if you click apply, it will drop it down to 250 US. And so if you want to take advantage of that, jump on, do that now. And, uh, and you too can have an opportunity to get access to my complete step-by-step -step guide to doing it yourself. So you're, you're thinking, wow, you know what? I've got a lot of things prepared. I just need a little extra help. I just want to make sure that I'm on the right track. This is for you. $248.50 is a fraction of the price that you would pay for anything else. Heck, to book a consultation with me, you're paying $210 for a 25-minute consult. But this course, guys, I spent hundreds of hours doing it. And so I want to give, um, I just want to mention that one, give a shout out to this. Get in there, subscribe, take advantage of it. Uh, because that's open. All right, let's see what we've got here as we flip back. All right. Um, okay, uh, do I need to issue a new Indian police certificate after visiting India when PR application is in process? Darshan, if you have, um, if you've already submitted your EAPR and it's locked in and your police certificate was valid at that time, no, you do not. No, you do not. Okay. Uh, okay, Kushik says, can we move to another PNP um, like province to Ontario before two years? If yes, how kindly answer. Okay, so understand if you are saying I've been I've been nominated, I have um, applied for permanent residence, and I'm living in a province, and I want to move to another one. 
The Charter of Rights and Freedoms grants you the ability to do it. But man, Kushik, there's people that would do anything to get a nomination to whatever province you're at right now. The reason those nominations were given to the provinces is because people just migrate to Toronto. They don't come to Lethbridge. Why are you not coming to Lethbridge, Alberta? It's a wonderful community. It's awesome. Every one of you should be putting destination on your express entry application, Lethbridge, Alberta. That's where you should be coming. But for those of you, the natural inclination is to go to Montreal, go to Toronto. Well, don't go to Montreal if you're express entry because your application will get refused. Toronto, to go to Vancouver. You know, those are the main areas that people migrate to. So for you, Koshik, I have to indicate, man, stay, give it a shot, fight. You know, you're the one that was nominated to help make that province better, so make it better, all right? But if truly you can't feed your family, you can't find a job, you've accessed all the resources that are available for you that province, well, then you can, you have the ability to move. Okay, and as far as this two years, that's meaningless. Two, the two years means nothing. I don't know where you had that number. Okay, you can, after you become a permanent resident and you genuinely have gone with an intention to reside in that province, then at that stage you're able to, um, to, to move if things aren't working out. Okay, let's see here. We've got uh, Priscilla gives a big shout out and look at this. Okay, I'll just show you guys. My dear mother is calling me. I love her to death. She is the center of my world, and I'll be honest, one of the reasons that I became an immigration lawyer, and I hate not to be able to answer her, but I'm on a live Q&A here, so I'll answer you, Mom, as soon as I am through this. Okay, uh, Clara says, may I know the options for a post-grad work permit holder who is not a permanent resident to continue working in Canada after the expire of the post-grad? Clara, in our last call that we had with immigration, they're aware of you. They understand. Now, you say you are not a permanent resident, okay. Are you eligible to apply through Express Entry? What is your score? How close are you, Clara? Um, ultimately, by the time your postgrad's ex getting ready to expire, unless you took the advice of one of those stupid overseas agents who convinced you to do a one-year program and your actual work permit was only valid for a year, then yeah, you're in a rough spot. But if you qualify for one of, like for Express Entry, and when you submit it, you then have the ability to apply for a bridging open work permit. But um, but yeah, understand, Clara, there is no mechanism for extending a postgrad work permit. Um, and you have to meet the requirements of, of the, the immigration programs in order to extend. Okay, Kushik, there's your question. We answered that one. Okay, Crudy says, I'm a university lecturer, 4011. Can I mention 4021 for college lecture where this knock is required? Dude, you're going to list what you actually did. You have to prove it, all right? So if you're working in a university, there's a reason it's a 4011 versus a college 4021. And if one of the knocks for one of the provinces is on their hit list, their, their, you know, their, their approved list is 421, trying to wedge yourself into that when you're not that, um, that's going to be an issue. But if you can actually show that you are, then, then you can do it, all right? Okay, uh, okay, Chamo says, may I know if processing of PR application starts even though there are some documents pending due to the COVID situation after receiving the AOR? Highly appreciate your response. Sorry I'm talking so fast here, guys, but I really want to get through these questions. You can read the question as I'm answering it too. So Chamo, the reality is um, they will not finalize your application. Will they start looking at reference letters? Will they start looking at those things that you should be able to provide? Um, yes, they will. Um, but at the end of the day, they're not going to um, they're not going to proceed forward to the actual approval stage unless they've had a chance to look at everything else. So if you're missing documents because of COVID-19, you've been forced to submit your application. Understand, it's just going to be held in the abeyance till everything is there. But they're not going to penalize you and let your ITA expire and not accept your EAPR if you're suffering from circumstances outside of your control. Okay, um, okay. Pulkit says my wife postgrad diploma. Uh, is about to get over from Ontario. Um, how can we proceed for PR or CRS after a diploma will be 418? Hey, my friend, you're gonna look. You're gonna need to look at different options right now. We're nowhere near 418 with points, and so either of you looking at your occupation, looking at your scores, you're gonna have, you know you're gonna have to realize that you're gonna need to accumulate some Canadian work experience or something to get those points up there. Because right now with the draw, like we we just looked at here. 
We'll drop this one off. We'll flip over to the website view here. Um, if you look at the rounds of invitations, right, you can see the lowest one, 440 right now. That's a far cry from your 418. All right. Okay. Moving through here. Okay, we got one from Kanwarjit. He says, just asking about, uh, asking out of curiosity, does a CRS score of 463 stand a chance once the federal program reopens? That, that is going to be a good question. Initially, I don't think it's going to be. If you remember, when we were in a normal world, when people, rounds of invitations were happening, we dropped down to, I think it was 469. Um, I can't remember if, uh, sorry, I can't remember if we actually got to 468. I'm not going to jump around there, but 463 was not on the radar. And with the number of people we have in the queue right now, if we once again flip over here to the website view, with the number of people that are queued up here, you can do the math, right? You can see at 471 or above, there's like almost 7,000 in this category. So if you split the difference and said 465 and up, that maybe there's, you know, there's 3,500, then you can see it's going to be a while because as language tests open up, more people are going to continue to file in at this range. All right. Okay. Let's flip back again. So now Grajesh, he says here, can I update work history in the profile after receiving an Ontario notification of interest before doc submission? I did not mention all the positions that I held in the company in the profile. Any updates that you make, if they are not affecting the substantive assessment that the the Ontario no you know basically your CRS score that triggered the um, uh, you know the notification of interest from the province in the first place as long as those underlying things are not being affected you can make changes for sure you can correct you can update and in fact Express Entry expects that you're going to keep things updated but if the Ontario notification of interest was issued based on a certain score for instance and the changes that you make cause that score to drop down, then that could absolutely jeopardize your application. All right. All right, all right. Okay, Kushik says, okay, we already answered Kushik's. Um, <laughs> okay, we'll be kind here. We'll be kind. I think I got Kushik. He probably uh, just didn't think it was going to be visible. So yes, Kushik, you can kind of yeah, you can stop spamming your question. Thanks for the shout out, Eli from San Francisco. Thanks for policing. Thanks for helping because, yeah, it does make it more difficult. And I am going to get to them, guys. I'm going through systematically. So hang in there. Okay. Uh, okay. Here's a good one. So this is Adgo says, the matter of Ethiopia, people don't get for your country. Tell me why. Canada has very stringent requirements when it comes to express entry. So it doesn't matter whether you come from Ethiopia, Islamabad, um, Saudi Arabia, uh, Antarctica, wherever it is, the points are all based on the same calculations. The difference, Adgo, is when you're applying for temporary residence, and this is probably where you're getting. Visitor visas, study permits, work permits, yes, they have a much higher threshold. Why? Because there's a higher rate of Ethiopians coming to Canada and overstaying. It has nothing to do with you personally, but they have these analytics. They can see how many people overstay their visas who don't go home. So when you have people that come to Canada and then don't go back to Ethiopia, it wrecks it for everybody else. And that's the reality. That's why. Okay. Good question. All right. Okay. Okay. Yasmin says, does the translation, which will be attested, and I'll get a true copy. Good. You need a true copy. I have to be grammatically accurate. Mine docs are supporting land deeds to prove my ties to my home country to be acquired. Okay. Well, in terms of grammatically correct, the translation needs to be accurate. If the translation doesn't look like it's actually been done by someone who is a certified, authentic, genuine translator, and then an officer has the ability to look at this and say, I don't think this is genuine. If they're not even able to translate properly into English, and I'm assuming that's what you mean grammatically. If there are spelling mistakes or things like that, well, maybe that's not the end of the world. But hey, if you've got those things, go back to the translator and tell them to do it right. This is your permanent residence that's at stake. Okay. Um, okay. Ezra says, hey, Mark, why the government doesn't give a clear statement on when will be the regular federal skilled worker? I'll be honest, Ezra, I don't think they need to. They don't owe any explanation as to who is going to be uh, included in the rounds of invitations, the kinds of draws, the program specific draws. They have no obligation to disclose any of that. They don't have an obligation to disclose what the pass mark is going to be what that level is going to be, all of that is within their right to do because it's all discretionary. 
And um, I understand how infuriating it is. I understand how difficult it is. But my view is as long as these travel restrictions are in place, and they're going to be in place probably till the end of June anyways, that we are only going to see CEC draws. Not until they're lifted um, are they going to start drawing federal skilled worker. Because at the end of the day, they have to figure out what the new norm is going to be, what the landscape is going to look like, what the future is going to be look like. And they don't want to have a whole bunch of people that have federal skilled worker applications pooling up in the queue that they can't actually land, that can't actually travel to Canada. It creates this logistical nightmare of all these people they're trying to track, who've submitted applications, who don't have all the documents ready. So this is why they're only doing CECs, because they have to get control over everything. Okay, um, Asin says, COP, I'm, I'm a COPER holder. My visa expiry is August 20th. I've not landed. I want to ask. I've recently changed my address. Do I need to update? Yes. Update your address. You bet. That's one thing that you do. Use the IRCC form like we talked about before. Let's see if I've got it here. I don't think. I think I deleted it. Anyways, go to the IRCC web form that I talked about in just a little bit and absolutely update that. Great question. Thanks, Austin. Okay. All right. Let's see what Marcella says here. Marcel. Sorry. Marcel says, no, New Brunswick announced that fall 2020 students can come to start class. What happens if your home country's borders are closed? Will CIC approve permits if your country's borders are still closed? Well, IRCC doesn't really track that kind of stuff. They don't. If you're applying for a work permit, the school is ha, you know has an open session, then it's up to you to negotiate with that school the ability to, um, to start online. And immigration is being very kind. They're giving credit if, you, if you're studying up to 50%. If it has to be done outside Canada because of travel restrictions, um, then they're going to give credit for it. You have to explain, and they're not going to penalize you for circumstances outside your control. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Radon says, hello, can I decline the ITA in order to come back and de delete a work experience I declared previously and couldn't bring the reference letters? I don't want to claim points for it. Okay, so there's a couple options with it. If you think you're going to get another ITA and you're very confident, then yes, I'd recommend you decline it, correct it, resubmit. If you're someone who's, for example... We'll drop this off. We go back here. If you're someone who is at, um, who just received an ITA at 440. Now I know you. This is CEC. It's not federal skilled worker, but someone there, boy, I wouldn't be de declining that. What I'd be doing is a big massive letter of explanation. Um, when you file the EAPR, I would remove that work history as long as there's no points and it doesn't affect your ITA. I would remove it. I would provide a letter of explanation saying. I'm not claiming any points for this. I know I put it in the work history in my profile. The company would not give me the letter. I tried. I don't need it anyways. So that's why it's not included. The A11.2 assessment looks specifically at whether or not removing that reference letter uh, or removing that work history, whether or not it would affect, affect your eligibility for the federal skilled worker. So would your 67 points drop below or otherwise not meet that eligibility requirements? And two, um, would a recalculation of your CRS score after removing that work history result in you falling below the round of, the round of invitations? All right. Good question. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Periscope. Hey, we've got someone else there. That's awesome. Okay. Naveen says, CRS of 472. Birthday coming in the last week of August. Do you think there's going to be a draw? Naveen, I hope for you that there is. I really do. June 30th. That's when uh, a lot of the travel restrictions, uh, right at the, the end of June, that's where at least those um, uh, those restrictions, those orders in council have, have kind of fallen with respect to the, the travel restrictions. Um, so we can cross our fingers, right? We can cross. So it's the end of August. We still have June, right? We still have July. We still have just about August. I sure hope so, <clears throat> but we'll just have to see. So I'm, you know, I'm thinking about you, Naveen. I'm thinking about you, man. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, so let's see. ISSX, do you need to include your old and new passport for study permit applications? My new passport is completely empty, but my old one is stamps and a visa from the US. What does the document check like ask? So in every, each, each country sometimes has their own requirements and request for documents. Because your new passport is completely clean, I would not be surprised at all if they wanted to look into your old one. So there's no harm at all in including that old one. And to preempt things, I probably would, even though it's not necessarily a specific requirement in a study permit application. All right. Um, 
Okay, Manju says, are the scores coming down? Okay, I'm not quite sure what you mean. We've seen them drop like a rock if you are a Canadian Experience Class candidate, right? 440 right here. That's crazy. That's crazy. Like, that's that's way lower. Obviously, it's because of a CEC only, and people have just been flushed out and flushed out and flushed out. But in terms of the CRS for the Federal Skilled Worker Program, like I said, I'm thinking it's probably going to be more in the range right here of 470 to 480. All right. Okay. Next question here. Um, let's see here. Okay. Mega says, when can we expect Auto to start sending out PPR emails, which has stopped due to COVID-19? Okay, Mega, if you're inside Canada, that those, those emails are going to be coming. Um, you should expect it. Um, like I said, those passport request emails, um, well, let me rephrase that, sorry. If you're in Canada, you may not even get a passport request. Um, ultimately, what they're doing during the time in which you actually complete landing or you become a permanent resident, they're just sending you this email that says, congratulations, you're now a permanent resident. You can treat this letter as your approval. So that's what they're doing inside Canada. Outside Canada, we are starting to see some instructions, some permanent resident applications being processed as the skeleton crews overseas have the ability to do it. Um, but yeah, Ottawa, if it's in Canada, the, they're issuing the email that says, voila, you're a permanent resident. Okay. Okay, Cynthia's got another question here. My husband's postgrad from New Zealand, uh, level eight IT, try to express entry. Okay, Cynthia, that's something that I'm going to push you back every time you guys right here to the consultation, book a consult. We can go through everything, everything. I charge $200 Canadian, Canadian dollars, which is basically what, like $2 US? Okay, no, it's not quite that bad, but Canadian 210 for 25 minute consult. Don't be deceived. This right over here, oh, how far can I reach? Only that far, right over here, this price that we have does not include the 25 minutes only that I'm talking to you. I get the information in advance. I go through it before we jump on the call. And when we are on that call, we hit the pavement running. There's no wasted time. So tell me about your situation. Sure, I may ask that question, but I already know what your main issue is before we ever get on that call. So <laughs> that's what you do when you're asking, do I qualify? Okay. All right. Uh, Amin says, very efficient process. Book a consult. You won't be sorry. Amin, you rule, my friend. That is so cool. That's why I'm grateful it's going to Periscope. Facebook sucks and we'll have to sort that out. But it's unbelievable. We've got such a great group of people here. Okay, those who are still uh, queued up, hang in there. I'm going to be getting to your question. I'm whipping through it as fast as I can. Okay, uh, all right. So current trends on the market in Canada, decline in intake of applications in the future, entirely possible. And it's just like any country in the world. If we can't keep our own Canadians employed, they're probably not going to be pumping in a bunch of new people. But understand, immigration is important. Unlike many other countries, Canada values immigrants. And any pause or any slowdown, our minister has indicated that they're going to take everything under advisement. They're going to look at things carefully. They're going to be responsible. But immigrants are important. Okay. Um, okay. Do you have someone to help with the Nova Scotia PNP? Oh, there's no problems with that, uh, Josh and Deep. If you're already going through the process and you have a game plan going forward, we can totally assist you within the office. So I don't want you to feel that we can't. What I don't do is the race to file draws where we're waiting for the category B to pop up and then everybody's racing to be the first one into the queue. I don't do that because it prejudices my client. How do I choose who I'm going to represent? So Josh and Deep, same story. Jump over here. Book a consult with me because I'd love to have you join me over here and uh, and we can go through everything and determine, you know, which program is the one that's right for you. Obviously, the PNP, um, uh, the Nova Scotia PNP, as we jump back to the main screen here, um, there's we have to understand what program. I don't know if you're in Canada or outside or whatever. OK, um, OK, here we've got Litsa says planning to come to Canada ASAP on my ETA then apply for an inland spousal. My question is, should I declare my intention to apply for inland sponsorship upon arrival at the airport? Uh, you, Litsa, I'm, the way I'm going to answer that is very clear. You have an obligation to inform immigration if there is any information that you are providing or should provide to them that could affect how they process your application. So on an ETA, coming to Canada um, for sponsorship, with my clients, we disclose everything, okay? Is it possible for an officer to say, hey, 
Um, your intention isn't temporary. I'm not going to let you in. For sure it is. It always is that, that the right to do that. But I can tell you that rarely, rarely on the Canadian side do they not honor what we call dual intent, the intention to abide by a temporary entry, whatever those conditions are, as well as having an intention to one day become a permanent resident. So that dual intention is built into the built into the immigration uh, the immigration laws. And so, let's say in your situation, your the biggest question right now is, you know, can you actually board a plane and be admitted? This type of an entry is considered to be optional. And if you go back and watch on Tuesday, you'll see we talked about that, Kyle and I. So you're not getting in anytime soon to do this. All right, at least the way CBSA is interpreting things. Um, okay, David says, would you ever recommend a study to stay strategy for an older applicant? And how would IRCC view dual intent in this instance? Okay, David, the reality is if you've got a, an application in the queue for permanent residence, you've been out of school for 15 years, and now you say, I want to come to Canada and take a diploma in something, everything is case specific. But in those circumstances, when Canada's study permit ranks and international student ranks have blown just crazy numbers, you know, I don't know, 700,000, Go back and actually you guys should watch. Um, I'm just going to flip back here to my website again. This time I'm going to, I'm going to try to find, I'm going to actually open up a new one. We don't need this one. If you go, if you go to my Canadian immigration podcast here, the last, uh, I've got four that I've got to release right now, but international students in Canada, um, what the future holds with immigration lawyer, Will Tao. Will is awesome. Um, listen to that. And there's a very, 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 um, good analysis on the future of international studies. Um, we didn't specifically, this was recorded pre-COVID-19, um, even though it was released, uh, when was this one released? I can't remember, May 6th. Um, understand that the realities are international students, especially if they're older, are going to be under a much, much finer kind of analysis. And uh, you're going to have to really make the case how the education when you're applying for your study permit is going to result in you being able to get a better job in your home country, not transitioning to permanent residence in Canada. So no mention of permanent residence. If you have a profile in the queue, you know, that's going to that's going to negatively impact on the assessment. They can't just refuse your study permit application because you have a, a profile in. But it's definitely a factor that then they'll look at the age. Does the education make sense? You know, how established are you in your home country? All of those things. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Ice says, I'd also like to know, and actually I need to flip this over to the main view here, sorry. And I will then go here. So Ice says, I'd also like to know if I can include evidence like URL links when writing your study plan for study permit. I wouldn't, you know, I would not put links. I would actually pull it in and include it as a document within your application. An officer may not have the ability to, to actually link. Now, theoretically, if they're looking on online, which all the applications are, they can do it. So there's no harm in leaving the link there. But I would try to pull up that data itself and make it included and a part of your application. Okay. Uh, okay. Cheating. This is a generic question. No clue. When can we expect PPR in future? Well, I can tell you until if you're outside of Canada, outside, remember, until those travel restrictions are lifted, they're they're not going to be um, they're not going to be releasing these a ton. We are hearing rumors that some are being uh, are being released. Okay, Ralph says Facebook has no audio. Oh, that's too bad. Um, thanks for checking in on that. Uh, th this is always an issue, and um, maybe there's some broken link between my software um, and Facebook. Hey, Facebook, they're not my friend. Anyways, okay, thanks for letting me know, Ralph. Okay, Chester says hey. Um, okay, Rajesh says, Knock 4031, ever got an invitation from any province? Rajesh, right back to here, my friend, right back here to this page, book a consult, we can assess, because there's so much more involved than just, hey, is 4031 good enough? Okay, back again, we've got a big thumbs up from Pre, thanks for the thumbs up. Um, okay, Akash says, Federal Skilled Worker document um, uploaded April the 7th. Still waiting for my biometric request. When can I expect the same? Also, my uploaded PC expires on June 8th. We'll have to get a new PC. Okay, the answer for the biometrics is when the VAX open up, when they start doing biometrics, um, that, you know, that will largely depend upon the current the conditions in those countries. Every country has their own rules. Um, so biometrics are a significant issue. Uh, with respect to your police certificate, it's entirely possible that they could request you to get an updated PC. 
So that's that's a possibility. It just depends once again on the stage at which you're at and whether or not they have a comfort level of saying, okay, we won't request it and we'll finalize Akash's um, application. Uh, okay, let's see here. Once again, Chester, I'll point you back here, my friend. Go here if you want generic information. Oh, I've got this on the wrong. I better close that one off. Uh, so for you, <laughs> where you're asking, hey, what are the requirements for Canadian citizenship? Uh, that's a general question that would require a consultation, my friend. Um, okay, Masood says work permits been in the queue for four months. Uh, if my wife applies for her open work permit to accompany me, will that increase the processing time of my application? Yeah, probably. The reality is um, none of this is considered to be um, uh, non-discretionary or non-optional. It's considered to be discretionary or optional. So if you can't actually travel and land in Canada, they're not going to be issuing these work permits. And remember, um, I think in the PDI we read right here, I'm going to go back to the screen. You can see here they've got priorities for processing. And let's see, do I have this? Just trying to find the notification. Looks like I skipped past it. Maybe it'll pop up here. Hmm. For whatever reason, it looks like it's, um, uh, we'll go to permanent residence. Yeah, remember we how we had that um, that notice? Maybe it's here. Regardless, interesting, interesting. I guess it's a caching issue. They recognize I've already looked at that notification, so I don't need to see it again. Um, in your situation here, understand certain applications are a priority for immigration, others aren't. And overseas work permits where the individual, um, yeah, where, where they haven't already been in Canada, they're, they're just delaying, they're holding off on those. Okay. Um, okay, Gagan says, I had submitted my profile without the Indian PCC for my spouse. Because of lockdown, we were unable to collect it. It's been 57 days past AOR. Can we expect uh, MEP without have PCC of spouse? You're, you, you're going to need to get that police certificate before they'll complete and land. So it's as simple as that. Um, it's possible you could get a biometrics request. It could be, you know, it's possible you could have all these things that move forward. Um, but the reality is in your situation, um, they're not going to prejudice you if there's something you can't get. But if you've got it, then make sure that you upload it, okay? Um, and I'm assuming when you say submitted my profile that you mean your EAPR. Okay, because obviously with the profile, there's no documents required. Um, okay, Ibrahim says, hello, thanks for the great content. You bet, Ibrahim, it's my pleasure. Um, I submitted my Federal Skilled Worker application, AOR December 2019, 82%. Um, okay, my visa office is Rabat and I can't have any info about the status of my application. I understand that processing bar that's going across there, my friend, is completely useless and worthless. I understand everybody's application is going to be fluctuating all over the place. December 2019, um, that's right in that range where we should normally be expecting to see your passport request. But at this stage, understand everything is being delayed. Nothing is being pushed forward. All right. You bet, Ibrahim. My pleasure. My pleasure. Okay. Um, Okay, so Anand says, wife's not accompanying, applied under CEC due to the low score. I haven't included my wife. She's in Canada with an open work permit. Oh, okay, I'm not sure who advised you to do that, Anand, but that's going to be really tricky. Um, the, the, you have to understand when you have a spouse that's actually living in Canada, there's a good chance when, they, when you say that that spouse is not accompanying, that they're going to call you on it. And it could significantly impact on uh, whether or not your, your PR application is going to be approved. I've seen situations, not my clients, where people have done that and actually they've come back and, um, and requested in, in, in a positive situation, they've sent a fairness letter, a procedural fairness letter saying, uh, we don't really think that your spouse is not accompanying. She's actually with you now in Canada. You need to really have a good reason why she's not accompanying and it can't and it better not be, I just wanted to get more points. So Anand, that's a serious, serious issue. Okay. Um, web forms, Ibrahim, uh, this is kind of up in the air. When it comes to uh, submitting through the actual web form, they're, they're actually pretty quick. You know, I would expect within a couple weeks you, you could get a response. It depends on the nature of the request. Um, okay, Ozo, I'm going to push you back here to where I push everybody else. Go here to our site. Here's our homepage. When you're here, depending on what view you have, most of you... Um, when you're you're coming to the website are probably looking at it from well that's interesting <laughs> hopefully my site isn't crashed no so most of you are watching it from this standpoint so you're looking at it like this I think in that kind of view so if you go up here to these little buttons in the top 
click up here and then click start here. That'll take you right to where you go to book a consultation. All right, I'll slide this back over so we can see it. Hooray, good stuff. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, okay. Okay, Victor's got a master's in Canada and a bachelor abroad. Profile, he entered both, but realized he didn't get points for the bachelor's. He got an ITA. Can I just now only enter my master's in study history? You know what? There's no harm in entering both. There really isn't. In your other one, you're just going to indicate that you don't have an ECA. And it's as simple as that. It doesn't hinder. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't benefit. It's neutral. Um, that's how I respond to it. Um, okay. Any confirmed news on distance study leading to postgrad work permit? The reality is with distance study, you're gonna, um, they are going to give credit for up to at least 50% of the time. So if you applied for a program that was two years and you actually had to study the first year outside of Canada because it was all online because of the travel restrictions, they have indicated IRCC that they will give you credit for that time as if you were in Canada. In other words, a two-year program, which would result in a three-year postgrad work permit. Okay, watch, watch as things unfold. Okay, um, all right, Bonica says, uh, once LMI is approved, can we apply for a PNP skilled category right away rather than applying for employer specific work permit? Is it possible so that we can get an open work permit? This is not, a, 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 this is not something that I would advise. Your LMIA was approved. The most important part is, is that it's designed, and I'm assuming it's a dual purpose LMIA, to actually apply for the work permit. If that employer no longer is in business, if they don't have the job for you, then nothing is going to happen. Immigration isn't even going to let you go forward. Um, the PNP obviously relies on the employer supporting your application, and they're going to ask the question, is this person's job offer still open? And if there's no job, nothing's going to flow. Good question though, Bonica. Okay, uh, Bosheng says, Alberta EE only sent out one NOI in May. Will we expect more NOIs to be sent out in May? Understand guys that uh, employment has been decimated in our province and Express Entry, they will, um, throughout the AINP, extend out those notifications of interest in order to make sure that individuals, um, um, that they're meeting their quotas. But at the same time, they're factoring in whether or not you can actually get a job. And that is one of the issues that they're looking at right now. And so individuals who are given these notifications of interest, um, if they receive them, they ultimately have to be able to demonstrate to Alberta that they have an ability to economically establish in the province. And yes, it's a long ways out when you're thinking about these. Like We're still seven, eight, nine, ten months for the, the processing of express entry. And then the, the four or so or five or however long for processing within Alberta. All of those play a role. But um, yeah, we don't know exactly. Just like the regular rounds of invitations for Express Entry, they don't they don't advertise this. Okay, uh, Kat, Katie says a friend's profile was deemed uh, not eligible. Aha! I believe even though her score was 491, what could be the reason? Language is 6.5. One year Canadian experiences as well as ECA docs. Okay, um, what could be the reason, Katie? <laughs> I'd need to go in, and this is what I do with people all the time. I recommend that your friend connects with me, does one of these right here, books a consult, and then we go on, do a screen share, we look exactly at the profile, how we answered the questions. There's a bunch of different things and it would be too hard to guess what the issue is um, without actually jumping on and sharing. So Katie, I recommend you send them over to book a consult. We can take a look at that right away. It's just not something I could guess. I wouldn't even venture a guess at this stage. If it was federal skilled worker, sometimes it's it's the um, work history um, with the Canadian experience class. Maybe there's some change that was made that caused the, the ineligibility. Maybe um, IELTS score or CELPIP score expired. Um, you know, the date. There's a whole bunch of other things that we look at. All right. Okay, we'll go back here. We'll jump to Lee. Uh, will my study permit application be in danger if I had refused for um, e visa several times and it was due to my country being ineligible to apply for it and I had no idea about it, so I kept applying. <laughs> okay, understand when you're applying for, so basically I'm assuming an ETA maybe is what you're talking about. Um, they take all those things into consideration. Ultimately, the 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 um, you know how much emphasis they put on you know, these multiple attempts to apply for, I'm assuming you're talking about an electronic travel authorization. And just because it was wrong, I just explain it in the study permit application and I leave it at that. Um, especially in those circumstances when it was just a mistake, it wasn't because they've actually assessed your application and refused it for some substantive reason. 
Okay, um, Kishin says, uh, can my um, spouse apply for a visitor visa? Okay, well, I think we've got that one already, right? Uh, after her residency application. Yeah, we talked about that. Okay, Outland. Okay, okay. Kishin says, hey there, I sponsored my wife under the spousal sponsorship Outland, so under the family class. What are your thoughts on when will they resume working on these apps? Any ideas if they would expedite these apps? Um, do you know what? In all honesty, at this stage, I would be very, very surprised if they would expedite anything realize that the offices are operating on a skeleton crew and that's why everything is ground to a halt everything has so not sure when it's going to resume but you guys will be the first to know when i know okay uh, solomon says refugee pro permanent resident application processing same story my friend right when it comes to processing any of these applications we're all in this in the same boat everything is ground to a halt okay uh let's see here Try to get to some fresh ones because people are reposting. You guys reposting. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So Creeper says, I've just joined in. My question, do you know when air travel resumed this year? We're not exactly certain. If you walk, if you go back, watch the video that I did with Kyle Heinemann on Tuesday. And we go through all of that in detail. We talk about the orders in council. We talked about the current ones when they're expiring the end of June. And so um, we're just going to have to watch it and play it by ear. As the, the, the affection rate of the coronavirus starts to level off, as the provinces feel like they have more control, um, that's going to be one factor. But understand, it's also a global factor. And so if they're saying Canada's doors are open, but new cases are coming in with people that are affected because their country doesn't have the same restrictions that Canada has, trust me, these restrictions are going to be in place for a while. Okay. Uh, okay, Babar says, uh, Ali from Pakistan, when, hi Babar, Ali, uh, Babar Ali, okay, from Pakistan, when will Canada open the international flights for temporary visa and holding? Okay, so understand, these travel restrictions, same answer, check out the post to, uh, on Tuesday that we did. Um, okay, Subrat says, my e-score is coming to 452. All right, I'm assuming you're a federal skilled worker, Subrat. If you were a Canadian experience class in Canada, you would have received an invitation to apply. Um, going down to 452 for a federal, very unlikely, my friend. Okay, owner operators, Jack, check out the previous Canadian immigration podcast episodes that I did, especially with Jeffrey Lowe. And Jeffrey, I'm so sorry. We just did an awesome one on business immigration that I've been trying to get released. But you know what, guys? <laughs> I'll tell you something. I have a presentation that I'm doing tomorrow for our National Canadian Bar Association's uh, webinar. It's kind of like an online conference. And, uh, and I did not go to sleep last night working to finish my 20 page paper as well as a detailed PowerPoint. I just got it in about 7 a.m. this morning, had about a three hour sleep. And, <laughs> and so my apologies, Jeffrey, for still not getting that, um, that uh, podcast episode uh, released. I have four that I've got to release, four that I've done interviews with people. So the, they are going to get released as soon as as soon as I can clear through this stuff. Okay, so owner operators, everything is kind of up in the air. Um, but when it comes to whether or not um, LMI exempt temporary work permit, it, there's so many factors involved. Jack, you're going to really need to book a consult. I don't know where you're coming from. Is this through? You know, is is there a possibility through NAFTA? Um, owner operators with LMIAs actually have to apply for a work permit. And um, that's the whole nature of the owner operator. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So Cynthia, same thing. Book a consult when we're getting into specifics of assessing your situation. Um, Marcella, study permits. Um, we talked about that one. Um, we talked about the Nova Scotia PNP. We got a lot of repeaters here. Um, okay. Sangam says, can I visit Canada and get entry into the country even if my PR application is pending? Once again, you've got the interplay between showing that you have a uh, ties to your home country that you will return after the visa is been issued. And when you have a PR application in the queue, um, and when you say pending, I don't know if that's profile or if that's actual an EAPR. If it's an EAPR, dude, the visitor visa is unlikely to be issued. Even a profile at that stage. I always encourage people if they want to come to Canada temporarily, Tossing out this whole world of COVID-19, make those applications first before you show any indication of permanent residence. Officers are trained to try to look at factors and tendencies. And if you've shown an interest in becoming a permanent resident, they're going to weigh that heavily against you when it comes to issuing any temporary application. Okay. Um, okay. Sibret says, Force 52 is the score. 
Wes considered master's as a dual degree. Okay, so you lost some points there. I'm planning to do a postgrad diploma in Montreal. Would it be any problem going for a study visa? At the end of the day, understand you still have all of the reasons you know, that, that we talked about before in each of these previous comments. Temporary intent, can you demonstrate it in light of the fact that you've got a strong intention to become a permanent resident? The legislation allows for people to have dual intention, but proving it to an officer when you're overseas is a different matter. Okay, Kushik says, thank you so much. You bet, Kushik, you bet. And I know everybody's anxious to get their questions answered. So, yeah, but but have patience. Okay. Um, okay, let's see here. Sandy, I think we answered yours. 472 birthday last week of August. Yeah, we'll just have to see. Um, okay, so Raphael, same story. Right here, my friend. Go here, book the consultation. We can get into the specifics of your particular application. But we just can't do it in the context of this. Uh, and remember, guys, as an immigration lawyer, if I'm providing you specific legal advice, um, that's something that I have to be very, very careful with. Answering general information, general questions, there's no problem with that. But once we get into the specifics of your situation, that's when it has to always go to a consult. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to just generate uh, income. Well, no, who am I kidding? I am trying to. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that people will book consultations with me. Why? Because they're totally worth it. They're, they go far more in depth to how I'm answering these questions here. And when you have specific issues like Raphael, you know, what's the situation? Here's my family. Are there options? There's nothing better than booking that consult. That 25 minutes, we can clarify everything so that you, all your doubts are resolved, so that you don't have any concerns. You either know, yes, I've got a chance or I don't. You don't have someone who's like peddling you this false hope, just milking you for money when you don't even have a chance of immigrating. The biggest pet peeve I have, Raphael, is people who, who charge to submit a profile into the express entry pool when someone is ranked, let's flip this back to the website, when someone is down here in the 400s, right? And they say, oh, you're eligible for express entry. Here, give me $500 or a lakh or whatever it is. I'll submit your profile for you. And you don't know, right? They say, oh, congratulations, you're eligible. Let me just steal your money, right? That's what I hate. And that's why the, the consultations are so important for me because if you don't qualify, I'll tell you that. And that's just as valuable well, it's not as uh, it's not as um, as pleasant news as if I tell you, hey, you've got all these options. But knowing that you don't qualify or your chances are low is just as important because then you can turn your mind to other countries, making your situation in your own country better, and and just base it on facts instead of guessing. Um, what should I write in the amount when I apply under CC and what should I upload in the proof of fund section? All right, let's flip back. Let's do a little training session here. Love these. Okay, let's go. We'll go here processing and we're going to go here to, okay, um, CEC uh, proof of funds um, IRCC. Let's see what comes up here. Should be the one I, yes, here we go. So here is the help center answer, my friend. And thank you, Tracy and the amazing team there with an express entry for creating these. Scroll down to the bottom. You do not need to have funds, blah, blah, blah. So what do you do? The system asks to provide proof. If you don't need to provide funds, you must upload a letter explaining either that you've been invited under the CEC or you have a valid job offer. So for you, it's a simple letter on a piece of paper that says, please note, I have been drawn under the Canadian Experience class. Therefore, I don't need to provide proof of funds. Boom, full stop. There you go. All right, let's see what we got next here. Um, okay, same thing, Raphael. We've got that question. Uh, okay, uh, uh, Sunatio. Uh, when Borders of Canada will open for migrants, watch last Tuesdays. Like there were very few people that actually watched it. You guys should have all been watching it if you weren't. Go back and watch it. This is so crazy. Like I, I can't believe Facebook. I'm, it's so disappointing for all those people that wanted to watch this on Facebook. I think maybe I'll just say screw you Facebook and we'll just do it on YouTube because at this stage they're just not cooperating. Anyways, so with that being said, um, at Borders, um, we just don't know. Uh, right now, some people can get in. So it depends on your situation um, and where you fit within the exemptions in the order of council. If you're overseas and if you're from the U.S., then whether or not you can show that the purpose of your entry is non-optional and non-discretionary, which basically means, well, immigration, the Canada Board Service Agency defines it as essential. Okay, all right. Keep going through here. Okay, Gopi says, when will the all program draw resume? I think when the travel restrictions are are, are are lessened. 
So I think it's going to be a while. <gasps> wow, no way. We actually have someone from Facebook. Oh my goodness, what's happening? How did that just happen? Okay, this unknown person. I didn't think we had anyone coming in from Facebook. CRS is 390. And can you advise me how to increase the score? Okay, once again, right here, I'm going to push you back, my friend. Book a consult. When it comes to how whether or not you qualify or not, the most important part is understanding your history, your background, why you're sitting at 390, and your work history, all those things, which have to be dealt with um, basically via a consult so that we can go through everything in depth. Um, okay, so we've got that. Ah, oh, another Periscope. Wow, that's awesome. We've got a great contingent of Periscopians. Okay, what's your question, Merce Nurse? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, Asan, COP holder, expires August, not landed. Um, yeah, update your address. Looks like these are kind of cycling around here. Um, okay, Karen. Oh, great. I'm glad that you are showing how smarty pants you are. <laughs> understand that just because some people they know that they don't have to have proof of funds but what you don't know Karen and you need to be kind because I think your, your your response was a little bit critical um, understand Arnesh his question was valid because when you're filing your application and you're you put it asks you questions you answer truthfully you put it says how much money do you have available well, when you're submitting your profile and your EAPR, you, you put a number in there. When you put the number, then it triggers a place for proof of funds in the document checklist. So in fairness to Arnish, and I'm, I really want Karen, you to understand this because I don't want people to be critical of one another for asking any questions or publicly shame them for asking questions because Arnish's question was actually really important. People do not know what to put in that section because they know they're exempt. So what do we do? So that's why the question was actually really good. Okay, and I'm not, I don't want to be too harsh on you either, Karen, but sometimes people, when they know just a little bit, then they end up, yeah, it ends up being, um, well, they just assume that everybody else should know what they know, and that's probably not fair. All right, we've got some other Facebookers here. This is so weird. Now they're obviously appearing. So Rural Northern, is it necessary to have an LMIA job offer for the respective communities or a normal job offer letter will be considered for the RNIP PR applications? The LMIA is not a specific requirement for these organizations, uh, for the communities, but you still, many of them still have to show the community that there is no local that's able to fill the position. So there are expectations for, um, for a lot of things that you have to do. Nishant just joined us. Hello. Kieran, watching too many Mark videos. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. So, okay. Okay. We've got Creeper here. Girlfriend wants to immigrate to Canada. She's a lawyer from Russia. How can she become a citizen? Please advise she doesn't speak English. Creeper then, one of the biggest issues is if she doesn't speak English, the likelihood of her being able to immigrate is extremely low. She'll need to start working on her English. All right. Um, okay. Let's see here. We've got a bunch of correspondence back and forth, Paternish. Okay, you guys are back and forth. It looks like I already answered it. Okay, how does holding a scholarship, Michelle says, that requires one to go back to their home country affect CRS points and the entirety of the PR application? Um, understand that when you have those scholarships that requires you to go back, it can impact on your ability to claim those points for the purposes of PR. So they actually, in those cases, um, at times, and understand there's a lot of different programs and I can't speak to it specifically, Michelle, but um, at times, immigration will refuse to recognize that education if it was, you know, for the purposes of you actually taking that education and going back to your home country. Think of it this way. If Canada has agreements with other countries to train their people so that they can get an education and then take it back to make that country better, it would be a little bit of a slap in the face to that foreign country if they paid for your education to come to Canada. And then Canada says, haha, now that we've got them educated, we're going to keep them. So that's that's one of the issues there. Um and I like Arnish and his responses to Karen. Exactly, that's the key. You can't leave it blank. So Karen, make sure, um, <laughs> make sure that you're really careful with the answers that you give. Jake, hey my friend, awesome, another Periscopian. Hey, this is the biggest Periscope uh, contingent we've had. <laughs> the wise monkey worldwide, have a blast. You too, my friend. Okay, Jake says, is it a good idea to apply for immigration before getting onto U.S. soil? Um, not quite sure, Jake, the nature of that question. Um, yeah, not quite sure. Maybe 
uh, are you are you thinking this is a U.S. immigration kind of podcast, or maybe you can clarify that question? And I am going to probably have to wrap this up pretty quick. We're at about an hour and twenty one minutes, but I wanted to just give and give and give so that you guys know that these live Q and A's are worth it. And I've been doing my very best to stay on top of everything, and I don't think I'm going to catch up to you guys. Um, Okay, here's a tough one for Gina. What are the options for those who have an LMIA but employers do not call them back to work? Gina, you are on precarious ground. I recommend that you do this right here. Um, go here, book a consult for us to examine the whole situation. Um, it's tough. It's really hard. The PNPs are being very unforgiving with this. Even immigration. The key here is that you have an obligation when you become a permanent resident to demonstrate you can economically establish yourself in Canada. And when there's no job, when the employer supporting your LMIA is no longer there, it can impact everything, all right? So as far as options, we really should, that's something that would require a whole lot more. Um, all right, huge shout out to Fritzy, who's like tagging all of the friends saying, hey, Mark's finally live, awesome. Can you guys on Facebook actually hear what, I am, um, what I'm saying? Like uh, there was an indication that maybe Facebook, and those are on Facebook, I'm assuming the Canadian... Um, Immigration Institute Facebook page is where you're tuning in from. But just give me some some thumbs up. Let me know if you are, um, if you, I'm assuming you can hear the audio. Okay. Uh, okay, Nessa says, okay, for example, you've submitted your application for a non, okay, EEPNP. So paper-based, we're talking 15 to 17 months or longer. You realize you've got, got a good shot in being drawn through EE. Can you apply through EE? Yeah, absolutely. There's no restrictions at all. You can have those multiple applications, Nessa. You can go through, submit your profile, do all of that. And then whichever one gets approved first wins. Good question. Okay, uh, this person says, my husband is an, on an open uh, open work permit as uh, you're a student here. Uh, my student visa is expiring March 2021. How can I extend his visa after March without a job offer? You can't. Understand that if you are applying for a post-grad work permit, you need to show that you're working in a skilled occupation. If you can't, your husband isn't getting his open uh, spousal work permit approved. Okay, all uh, right. An unknown, Hukit, Mr. Mark Hukit, I'm waiting for you to apply for a visa. Okay, great. Understand, my friend. Uh, whether you say you help or not, book a consult and we can talk about it. I'm more than happy to help. Okay, but in terms of what visa you're talking about, I have no clue, my friend. Um, it's, <laughs> I don't give out visas. I don't approve visas. You have to demonstrate that you actually qualify for them. Okay. Okay. At what point Chris Villa says, does your file move from the centralized intake office to the LVO or case processing center? It's case specific. It always, always is case specific. And so they move these applications all around the global network now. And because especially when you have electronic ones, um, uh, they can be processed literally anywhere, especially in this world of COVID-19. Okay, um, Varun says, created profile a year ago with two years experience, 453, my profile expired this month. Oh, Varun, I'm so sorry. Hi, Sheena, good to see you. Um, okay, another person asking, when will the draw happen for international candidates? Federal skilled worker, we just don't know. When the travel restrictions are lifted, that's when I think we're going to start to see more action there. Um Okay, okay. Murugam says, Murugam says, Coper holder, visa expires August. Is there any activity that I need to do meanwhile? You've just jumped on. What you need to do, I explained this already to, um, to Mishi, my good, good friend, Emeka. Um, what you're going to do is, I'm going to flip over to here. Uh, <clears throat> we're just going to go here, IRCC web form. I've cleared it off, but essentially you're going to go to the web form. And if you are unable to travel before your confirmation of permanent residence expires and your visa expires, then what you're going to do is you're going to submit a web form explaining that, putting all the information in. You could even include, if you wanted to, a copy of your COPR or whatever uh, in, the, in the documents if you wanted to. But you're going to explain the situation and you're going to tell them you you will. You definitely want to come to Canada, but the travel restrictions are preventing you from um, from being able to board. So please uh, keep the application open. That's what you do. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Let's see with this. Mohammed says I received the pre-arrival letter for spousal sponsorship outland last month. What happened after pre-arrival? Uh, do they co conduct background checks, as it says on CAC website, that we will let you know when we start your background check? I'm confused. Yeah, all of this is all in turmoil. So, Mohammed, the the re 
like there it's I can't tell you exactly how this is all playing out. Everything is in turmoil. Um, and um, yeah, I can't give you a clear answer on that one. Um, okay, this is a tough one. Sheena says, how would you claim uh, points on an experience that is fluctuating hours? Um, is it even eligible? Love your inspirational work, Sheena. This is the reality. With One thing you'll see here, I'll just flip this over quick to my screen once again. We'll just jump around. There's my podcast. I keep dropping things off. Let's go to FS, FSWP eligibility. Oop, eligibility, there's the one I want. Okay, while I'm here, and we'll open it up, <clears throat> you'll see when it comes to uh, skilled work experience. Okay, so there's all the requirements, blah, 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 part-time work. So there is the ability when you are claiming part-time work experience to actually, uh, you can't uh, count hours um, as long as it adds up to 1,560. They've added some other stuff in here. But the key is, um, let's see, full-time equal part-time. We don't count hours above 30. Look at these buggers. They've changed this. It used to say that they would average. So this is, oh, I guess I haven't looked at this for a while. So in for, for part-time work, they would um, they would average the hours. And uh, I'll find the link to it. Um, I'm just looking here to see. Maybe I skipped past it. For part-time, they had indicated previously that they would actually average the hours in. But in your situation, when you've got a huge fluctuation like that, you're going to have a real hard time trying to claim that as skilled uh, as full-time work. And so, Sheena, the best thing I can tell you, like I'm telling everybody else, we need to get into the really dive in deep and see exactly what the situation is, see how those hours fluctuate. Um, because remember, once you've claimed the one year of skilled work experience, uh, or at least you can show that one continuous year, then you have the ability to kind of break down bits and pieces to accumulate the rest for the purposes of the comprehensive ranking system. Okay, um, keep going here. Okay, Harshil, what about a wrong knock code posted in post AOR? My friend, I hope you didn't hire someone to help you that got that knock wrong. Um, there's nothing I hate more than to see people whose express entry dreams are shattered because the knock code is wrong. Changing it after AOR is is just, dude, you can try, right? You can try. Um, even though they're both in a skill, like you're probably software, I'm assuming, 2173, 2174, something like that. Should I put a web, web form up telling them to change my knock code? You can try. You really can try. If you truly feel that the wrong one is there, that's your only option is trying that. Okay. Um, okay, Raphael, Federal Skilled Worker, O, Ontario. Uh, Federal Skilled Worker Outline Express Entry. Um, AOR March the 30th. <clears throat> Processing times, yes, will be affected. Absolutely, they will. Um, okay, what's the minimum English level for application? Okay, it's it, the minimum to get into Express Entry is a CLB 7. But understand, going through the process of applying, unless you have a 9 or even 10, you don't have a prayer. And yes, health issues can be a problem. You need to assess those. Bassett gives a shout out. Took a scene. Hi, great to have you. Um, okay, Hussein says, can we create two profiles um, in, in which one application has my wife and the other me? Absolutely, 100%. 100% you can do that. Like you've pointed out, maybe there's a not code in a province that you have. Maybe your CRS score is lower, but your not code, your work experience is one that they're actually interested in. So it's entirely possible. And I recommend that people do that. Once someone is in a stage where they're drawn, then you can cancel the other profile and add them in. All right. Well, the reality is you're both added into each other's anyways when you submit it. All right. Another Periscoper, Perpetual Scholar. Hey, Mark, is it possible to apply for EE while we are studying outside of our home country? Um, uh, yeah, there's no problems with that at all. It doesn't matter where you live, what your status is, um, you know, whether you're temporary, permanent, whether you're a citizen, you can definitely do that. Good question. Um, okay, Varun says, uh, profile 453 expired last month. If I include experience letter from the old employer, which I didn't show first time, my CRS jumps to 478. Dude, why did you not include that the first time? Um, you're gonna if you if you actually didn't include it, you, you're gonna need to explain it, my friend. So Varun says, can I add it in now? You need to explain it and prove why in your first one. But understand, the first one was just a profile; it wasn't a formal EAPR. So they do treat those differently. But I would, you know, it's a part of your record. I would explain it. Uh, okay, Felix, woo celebration! That is so awesome. Okay, today I got an ITA, how long it's going to take to get my landing papers for entering Canada. I'm in India right now. 
Felix, that congratulations, that is so awesome. As far as getting that ITA, how long? Oh my goodness, you're not in Canada, my friend. Travel restrictions, all those things are gonna be all needing to take place before you're ever gonna be able to come back. Okay, great, this person's got audio. I don't know what happened with all the Facebookers before. Okay, um, okay, so we got a repeat. Yasmin, I actually answered your question there. Um, make sure it's correct, simple as that. Okay, if he says Facebook's got audio, great. Okay, everybody's got audio, thank you. Um, okay, and then this one, Aaron says, will students be allowed to come into Canada for the fall? It depends, it depends. We just have to watch, monitor the situation. Akash, you're very welcome. Um, is it a good time to apply for a visitor visa for parents? No, Absar, they're not gonna be admitted. Watch the episode that I did last Tuesday, just two days ago, and you'll see why. Um, okay, uh, JD says, uh, hey Mark, you're awesome, thanks for sharing your experience. Me and my wife both live in Canada, great. We got an ITA, our work permits are expiring. I'm primary applicant with postgraduate work permit and wife has open work permit. Um, that is awesome. Okay, so work permits expiring. Dude, you guys need to get your EAPR submitted. Um, I'm happy to help with that, but the strategy is get your documents ready, submit your EAPR. Once you've got it, then you're eligible to submit your bridging open work permit. You've got to get that in, get it ready before your current work permit expires. Okay, is immigration open? Well, somewhat. Okay, Felix is there celebrating. Yep, super, super happy about that. All right, guys, I think I'm going to have to shut her down now. I am at whew, one hour and a half. Any longer and, and YouTube's going to think that I'm some kind of crazy person uh, being on the call for so long here. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining. I really, really appreciate it. You guys are what makes this so awesome. This is why it's so good. Sorry about you Facebookers who, for whatever reason, were kind of blocked initially. And, um, and uh, we will be doing this again on Tuesday. I may be bringing in a good friend, Ravi Jane, who is the chair, current chair, of our national immigration section to talk about immigration in the same way that I did with Kyle, who is, who's the secretary right now for our section. And so I'm experimenting with them, bringing them on. So next Tuesdays might be a targeted one, but we'll definitely open it up to answer questions and things like that. You have to watch it. I really want those ones to be successful um, because when you bring in more people, then there's great opportunities uh, to really collectively come to some cool, cool decision making. All right. So those of you who weren't able to get your question answered, um, my apologies for that. Remember that I try to do these every Tuesday and Thursday right now at 1 p.m. I was a little bit late getting started here. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a mixed bag as we go forward. I've got a lot on my plate, but I want to just thank all of you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this. And um, I'll give one other little notification for those of you who are jumping on late. Guys, everything I've talked about here is all in this Express Entry DIY course. It is totally worth the money. I'm not a salesman. But I'll tell you, I have no problems pitching this over and over and over again. You guys who think it's not worth it are idiots. I'll be honest. I put hundreds of hours into this. I had someone who recently requested their funds be returned um, because they didn't think that there was anything of value in there. I looked at what they looked at and they didn't even delve into everything that was in the course. I gave them their money back, hands down, and I do that. There's a 100% 30-day money back guarantee. If you feel like this does not help you or is not valuable, notwithstanding all of this, many, many people that have given me testimonials who are now, all of these are all permanent residents, except a mech at Maki right here. Machi is ready to come and he just needs to get that plane boarded. Um, he's gonna have to get his extended because he, he, you know, he was just live here right now. Um, he's been going at this for a long time, but you are gonna succeed, Machi. You're gonna succeed. Um, guys, this is totally worth it. And it just, it breaks my heart that more people don't trust that it is. You freaking watched me for how long, you guys? Like, for how long have you followed me and all these videos and go look, go watch? And I do this. 497 is what people pay regularly. And they pay it, right? 497 US is worth every penny of this course. But periodically, out of the goodness of my heart, I drop it down a little bit. So 248.50 is like that's not even on the radar, you guys. You blow more money chasing after um, overseas agents, people that claim to know what they're doing. You spend 10 times that for something that doesn't even come close to this. So guys, take advantage of it. Type in the, the code EEDIY50, just like I punched in here. When you punch in that code, you get access to this. And I'm in the process. I have got a brand new camera. I'm super excited about it. 
um, a brand new camera, a new setup that's going to create videos that are far more clear, crisp, and I'm going to be revising all of this course. And when I do it, guys, everybody that's purchased this version, guys, everybody that's purchased this version will have lifetime access to it. But I'm going to be upgrading. And those of you, I'm in the, pro I'm in the process right now of trying to understand exactly how I'm going to structure this. But for the price guaranteed is going to go up. But 248.50 US is a steal, and I I announce it quite frequently. I try to offer this to only you who actually sit here and watch this video. But it just breaks my heart when I see people who and we've got the questions here. They posted them. They've made some little mistake, like the wrong knock code. I go through all of this in detail. There are so many videos. There's so much there available for you guys, and all you have to do is just take advantage of it. The money is totally worth it. And if you come back and you say, Mark, it wasn't worth it then I'll give you your money back. 100%, no questions asked. I've never had a person, and I've only had a very few that have done it. Most times, like I said, they haven't actually looked at it. But in this course, guys, in this course, I'll just log in as if I was a student right here. You can see that I have broken down every single aspect of this whole process from understanding the basics in module one, preparing to submit your profile. So one and two are for you guys even that may not even qualify. But this will help you to know whether or not you should even proceed. Then those who submit a profile, there are tons of lessons and they're all broken down to every single part of the express entry profile. Applicant details, representative, work history, personal details, and then we get into the details for your spouse. There's work history sections. There's a section that t that is targeted to every single aspect of it. Even registering on the job bank if you want to do that. Okay, so all of that's here. That's the profile section. Great, that's just the profile. Fine. Well, understand, I spent, I don't even, I can't even describe to you guys how much time I spent going through and creating the EAPR section. Why? Because you can't access it unless you actually have an ITA. So I had some awesome clients that agreed to let me use their profiles as the basis for recording this. So even then, I had to go through great extent making sure that everything in their actual um, profile, and I'm gonna. I think you guys can see it here, and I'm just gonna jump ahead. Information contained in any of Play it. You can't really see it fully, but I had to screen out. What if I blow this up bigger? Maybe you guys can see it better. I'm not sure, but I had to actually screen out their names, frame by frame. There's a reason that there are not courses like this out there, because unless you actually have a real live one to work from, you can't do it. So I spent hours going through this section and redacting and not only answering all the questions, telling you what to do, advising you of all of the, the, the common pitfalls and problems. No, it's not a specifically tailored course to you. Of course it's not. But I have tried to anticipate every single problem that people have. Do I include them in these sections? No, I don't. So these are pretty fast. I zip through, I highlight the areas where people have problems the most. But I go through all of this and you can see here, how many are there? We're up to here at the end. We are up to 39 here by the time we've completed the EAPR, the question part. Then we take a step forward and there's a whole section on just the documents. And not just the documents, you guys. You can see here the total lessons, 44. It's not actually, there's 45 because I've got a 43B, which is completing biometrics, which was added after. As things need to be updated, I update them. But 44 individual lessons, 40 here is the bomb. 40 is the bomb because it is full of sample documents. Everything from ECAs, what they need to look like or what you should expect for everyone so you know someone's not scamming you. Um, what cell pips look like, sample gift deeds that are downloadable, job offer letters, employer reference letters. All of the samples are here to help you and to navigate your way through it. Sample police certificates from other countries, um, medical, what it looks like, gift deeds. Everything is here. Everything that you need to form a part of your application is all a part of this. And guys, this course is awesome. And I have no reservation saying it. And all of you haters out there don't have a freaking clue and are keeping other good people from being able to take advantage of this course. Okay, so there's everything within the actual EAPR. But the specifics, the details, the tricky situations, that's why I created the member resource section. And the person who asked for their money back, which they promptly received it, this is where they never even took the time to look. They have no clue. 
because in here is where all of the meat is. But I'm not going to tell everybody how to do self-employed and make everybody sit through a lesson on self-employed work experience when they're going through their own portal. It would be a complete waste of time. So instead, I built it into here. So work experience, I have a very detailed lesson that's all about how, if I'm self-employed, how do I prove my work experience, right? There's a whole bunch of other aspects that are unique, specific to all of these areas. There's general information, you bet. Work experience, specifics of language where we dive in, deep dives. There is express entry eligibility. You know, one of the things is how do I increase my chances of, of getting accepted? That's, a, that's a, a critical one. Job offers, what are they? How do they work? Proof of funds, we talked about this. Right, one of the questions that for people that were actually in here, one of the things we talked about was, what do I do when I have a CEC application and they're asking me to upload something into the proof of funds? It's here, okay? How do I prove that I have enough? Um, what if I don't have proof of funds? What do I do then? This gets into the gift deeds. Guys, I just, it's hard for me to be a salesperson, but for $248.50 US, this is nothing. It is absolutely nothing compared to the value that's in here. And if you want to go back, look at all the people in, in the, you know, in, um, on the landing page, all the testimonials, the people that are even on here, Emeka can tell you, he's a permanent resident. Well, he's got his approval. He's the last one of the, the, the ones that, that gave me that, that, that recent round of, of um, uh, video testimonials. Police certificates, dependent family, um, non-accompanying spouses. This is actually how to fill out the section if you have a non-accompanying spouse. Education, all those questions about it. And you can see it's all organized. It's easy for you to sift through. It's easy for you to find versus going to this awesome page. And you can see the challenges. The reason, one of the reasons I created it is because on this page here, as a lot of you, as a lot of you know, I have all of my past, um, all of the past videos are here. And if you click on the video section and you're watching, yeah, they're here, but they're not broken down into specific areas. I talk, there are some, you know, that, that I address specifically at the beginning that you can see here. But for the most part, you have to watch like an hour and hope that you can find it. And I stopped, I stopped creating timestamps for these videos. The reality is it's all here, um, right in the actual guide. And so medicals, provincial nomination, what if you've got another name, a change of name? What if you have relatives in Canada? Dependent children, spousal relationships, provincial nomination programs, again, more details. You know, what PNPs participate in express entry? Express entry refusals. What do you do? What are the main reasons that, that it gets rejected? How can you prevent it from becoming, from you becoming it? So those of you who are tuning in, um, you know, you guys, I'm going to, I'm going to stop answering questions uh, for today, but please, please understand that this is here and I strongly, strongly encourage you to take advantage of it. Go to the Canadian Immigration Institute, click on see our courses. Within here, choose Express Entry, the complete step-by-step -step guide to doing it yourself. Those of you who are wondering about job offers, send your employer to purchase LMIA courses for high wage positions because that teaches them how to do a job offer for you if you've got someone in Canada that wants to hire you. You click on purchase now, and when you purchase it, you type in the code EEDIY50. So Express Entry, do it yourself, 50 will drop off half. Like that's half, guys. And I, I'm this the, I'm gonna stop doing this, I'll be honest, because there's no point in doing it. You know, people are paying it at 497 and uh, they're just stumbling upon and going through the process. But you know, if if people are not interested in taking advantage of the 50%, why do I even bother promoting it? <laughs> So I might as well just leave it at 497, especially if you guys feel like you get all your questions answered in this and you don't need to purchase it, then I guess there's no point in me offering a discount. The people that want to purchase it understand the value that it's probably worth about a thousand US will go through and they'll purchase it at 497 because they recognize that that's a steal of a deal. But I'm putting on my salesman hat and it is what it is. <laughs> but next Tuesday, I'll be here live again. Take advantage of this, guys. 497 is 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 that in in and of itself is a deal. So 248.50 or whatever it is, 248.50 after the discount is totally worth it. It will help you avoid all of the most catastrophic things that people face. Those of you who want to book a consult with me, you say, look, Mark, I just want to hire you. I just want to use you. I'll show you guys one more thing on the site, which I don't really promote. 
you guys can go out there, you can look around and you can price it out, okay? If you go to my site, you click on price, you will see right here for individuals that for express entry, I charge $3,000 Canadian, which is a fraction of what other immigration lawyers charge and even consultants. And what I offer is me. Me and you, we work together. We put your package together. You submit it. You have control. That's what we're offering. So to do that, click on the start here button. It will take you to the actual consult. And then from there, you're then able to move forward and uh, start the relationship with me. All right, guys. It was awesome. Once again, another fantastic one. Thank you so much for tuning in. Shabam's got a sad face. He's not taking any more questions. I'm so sorry, Shabam. I have to drop this off. It is, I've ha I'm operating on about two and a half hours sleep and uh, I have still a bunch of things, including a podcast for, in fact, to release. And uh, I'm at an hour and 47 minutes, which is an insane amount of time just to give. So 140 at $400, $400 an hour, that's just about $800 there of time that I'm just giving away, but I'm happy to do it. I just have to cut her off sometime. So those of you who are tuning in, thank you for doing that. I will see all of you guys next Tuesday. I suspect I'm probably going to have Ravi joining me, but we will have a separate um, question section. And I look forward to, yeah, for you guys joining me. You guys make it all possible. All right. Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer. Yes, I am a Canadian immigration lawyer, an ex-immigration officer. That's how I got into immigration in the first place. <laughs> That's where I developed my love of it. And a former high school teacher which is why I'm doing all of this. So thanks so much, guys. And uh, just give me a shout out as we wrap this up. And this is Mark Holthy, Canadian Immigration Lawyer, signing off saying thank you so much for joining me. And I wish you guys all the very, very best as you navigate this crazy world that we call, well, right now it's called COVID-19 and it's causing a lot of problems. Take care, everybody.